Our next panel will be looking at what Michigan is doing to advance several initiatives to address the opioid crisis that faces our state and our nation. This panel offers insight into each initiative in order to identify common themes and opportunities to collaborate. The themes that will be explored include innovation, innovative use of the existing statewide infrastructure, like the admission, discharge, and transfer messages to enable more timely surveillance of opioid overdoses and query-based functionality to expedite death investigations completed by medical examiners. All initiatives are focused on building organizational partnerships to achieve more real-time responses in order to prevent future opioid overdoses. The moderator for this session is Dr. Tom Simmer, Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. And participating are Amanda Kogowski, Project Manager for the System for Opioid Overdose Surveillance at the University of Michigan Injury Prevention Center. Matt Buck, the State Assistant Administrator at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And Jared Wilohodsky, Senior Project uh, Policy Analyst at the Policy and Innovation Division of MDHHS. Please welcome our next panel. Uh, thank you, Shelley, for establishing the expectation that we will address all of the issues associated with the opioid crisis and uh, have those issues resolved and uh, clarified within the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Um, it, it actually is true that so much of what we need to do to address this crisis is to first understand it in its many dimensions, and I think you'll hear a lot of us sort of seek to set up the infrastructure that will allow us to understand what the dynamic actually is. What you'll see is that this is a changing picture over time and that we need to have more real-time information to understand how it is changing in response to our efforts. Next, we have to um, understand all the various treatment modalities and how we can make them available to people because right now there are many evidence-based uh, treatments that are known but not available, and many other forms of treatment that are episodic and disconnected and demonstrating all sorts of failure because they aren't brought together into an integrated whole. So you can see there's many different aspects to this, and I think we'll just um, start off with, by having Jared sort of lay out a general picture, and then we'll go to some more specific efforts that we're doing to, to better get our fingers on the pulse of this problem. All right, uh, so as Dr. Summer said, I'm gonna get, provide a big picture overview of the opioid epidemic in Michigan uh, and some of the uh, strategies to address this epidemic, and then uh, Matt and Amanda are gonna give some more of the technology-focused uh, solutions to, uh, to address the epidemic. So, uh, so MDHHS is our approach has been really data driven. So we really have focused on five key data points to address uh, this epidemic. Uh, all, we're looking at all drug deaths, all opioid deaths, uh, the total number of opioid prescriptions written, neonatal abstinence syndrome cases, and the number of people in uh, publicly funded substance use disorder treatment for opioids or heroin. Uh, so what we have seen has been uh, in all drug deaths, we have seen the number of dr drug overdose deaths double uh, from 2011 to 2017, around 1,300, uh, an increase of 1,300 drug overdose deaths. And if you look at the, all the, the total opioid death, uh, the next uh, key data point, there was an increase of right around 1,300 as well. This, this big increase in drug deaths has been predominantly driven by opioids. Um, so for opioid, total opioid prescriptions, 
you know, this epidemic has evolved. Uh, from now, we have seen uh, predominantly synthetic opioids driving the death rate. Uh, but for most, for around 80% of people who are, who are using heroin, they start out misusing prescription opioids. So it's really critically important to reduce the uh, total number of opioid prescriptions written uh, as a way to uh, prevent more people from developing a substance use disorder. And this is one where we have seen uh, a pretty uh, sizable decline in opioid prescriptions written in the state. If you had the 2018 numbers are even uh, less than the 2017 numbers. Uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome cases, so this is the group of conditions associated with, the, with uh, drug withdrawal for, in newborns after being exposed in utero. This is something where we have seen uh, you know, a pretty significant increase over the last few years as well, though we have seen some stabilization in the last few years, and we hope that this is the start of a trend with this condition. Uh, and the last key data point that I wanted everyone to, folk, everyone to take a look at is the number of people in uh, publicly funded treatment programs. This number has gone up significantly, uh, and this is a number we actually want to see go up for now. While there's a demand for people to have uh, substance use disorder treatment, we want to see that this number up high for now. Uh, so real quickly, this uh, it kind of goes to the point I made earlier about the synthetic opioids that are driving the death rate, as, as we've seen in the state. Uh, that bottom red line um, is, what we, is the significant increase since 2014 has been synthetic opioids like uh, fentanyl, carfentanil, that have been driving uh, the death rate here in this state. So MDHHS has focused on a public health approach to the opioid epidemic, you know, so we focus on prevention, early intervention, and treatment. Uh, so some of the prevention techniques that we are uh, focused on, including uh, better access to uh, better data sharing, uh, reducing the total number of opioid uh, prescriptions that are uh, uh, available. Uh, other things include early intervention, including promoting uh, screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. Uh, treatment both refers to both long-term recovery and then uh, promoting access to medication-assisted treatment, but also uh, promoting access to the life-saving drug naloxone. So the biggest thing, I always point out this, uh, this uh, people ask what has the state of Michigan done to address the opioid epidemic. One, uh, the single biggest thing that we have done in this state to address the op opioid epidemic was expand Medicaid. Uh, Healthy Michigan has provided a significant number amount of money to substance use disorder treatment services, uh, which in fiscal year 17, Healthy Michigan funded $80 million in, in SUD treatment. And we, our estimates are over half of these, uh, this fund is uh, related to opioids. Uh, a couple, you know, one of the things that, uh, one of the ultimate state of Michigan strategies was the 2015 op Prescription Drug and Opioid Abuse Task Force. So this uh, task force was appointed to look to develop different recommendations to address prescription uh, drug and opioid abuse. Um, so they released a report in the fall of 2015, and for MDHHS, we've been working on uh, addressing the various recommendations that were in the report. I'm going to go over some of them with you real quickly. Uh, one of the things that was a recommendation was increasing public awareness. Uh, so one of the things we did was we launched a statewide media campaign in 2017, which uh, for both, you know, phone uh, aimed at both providers and the public about the risk of, of opioids and where to get help. Uh, so this is something where our statewide campaign directs people to michigan.gov slash opioids, uh, where they can find uh, information, uh, again, about treatment services and where they can get uh, other information that's relevant to them. Uh, here's a screenshot from the website when you go to it. Uh, one of the more, uh, one of the, definitely one of the uh, strategies that we're so really proud of has been the, uh, the naloxone standing order, which allows naloxone, which is a, the life-saving drug to reverse an opioid overdose, uh, to be available uh, similar to over-the-counter. Uh, we have over half the pharmacies in Michigan that are participating in the standing order, uh, and we have seen over 4,000 uh, doses of naloxone that has been filled under the standing order. Uh, you know, we really are quite pleased by the numbers that we're seeing and a lot of, and the participation from pharmacies across the state. 
Um, and this is a, a screenshot. When you go to our website, you can actually go and look and see which pharmacies are enrolled in the standing order. Uh, this is something I always, when I present, people ask, what can we do to uh, address this epidemic? Like, individually, what can I do? I always encourage people that take a look at your, uh, look at the pharmacy, see if the pharmacy that you go to is enrolled in the standing order. Uh, if not, I mean, I, when you go have your prescriptions filled, uh, just talk to the pharmacists about the value of having uh, the increased access to naloxone uh, and, and ask them to uh, enroll in the standing order. Uh, various different legislation was, has been passed over the last few years to address the opioid epidemic. Uh, you know, things like greater patient education requirements. There's a new uh, consent form that patients before starting an opioid pers uh, prescription must uh, fill out start, that started last summer. You know, there's now a seven-day prescription limit for acute pain. Uh, there's different educational requirements for students, and I didn't include here on this slide, but if, uh, there is a really important one, which is the mandate for the use of Michigan's MAPS program, our prescription drug monitoring program. And another thing that was uh, a recommendation of the 2015 task force was to have some type of ongoing uh, commission to uh, ensure implementation and make recommendations about um, about the uh, as this crisis has evolved uh, to be able to come up with new recommendations. So this commission met and finalized another report in August of 2018. Very quickly, a few highlights of this report, uh, including uh, greater some of the recommendations include greater uh, training of medical professional professionals on prescribing and addiction. Uh, expanding of treatment courts and training for judges, um, requesting a federal law change to 42 CFR Part 2, which is, uh, you know, the privacy law concerning uh, substance use disorder treatment. Uh, you know, it's much more strict than HIPAA, which often is a uh, challenge to sharing data for patients. Uh, then there was the recommendation on school curriculum. My last slide, uh, we've heard a lot about different funding that have come to Michigan over the last few years. Uh, SAMHSA, uh, the federal agency, has provided two large grants to Michigan, one which is $16 million for two years and another one that was nearly $28 million for two years. And these grants have been used to expand prevention, treatment, and recovery services. Um, so uh, we'll have questions later for the panel and I'll turn it over to Amanda. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. My name is Amanda Kagowski. I am the System for Opioid Overdose Surveillance Project Manager um, at the University of Michigan Injury Prevention Center. Um, so the principal investigators of this project are Drs. Rebecca Cunningham and Jason Goldstick. And I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge um, the rest of the study team, Jessica Roach and Zaire Tati. So, Jared, thank you for that great overview um, of the work the state is doing and then the current um, opioid landscape in the state of Michigan. Um, so one tool that is really needed to address this crisis is a real-time surveillance system that tracks overdoses that public health and public safety can use to implement data-driven responses in locations uh, across the state that are in the most need. Currently, um, nationally in certain areas and in um, some areas in Michigan, um, the data lag um, is several months and public health and law enforcement are using um, this several month old data to allocate their resources and interventions. So with all of this in mind, the University of Michigan Injury Prevention Center partnered with the Michigan HIDA um, to develop the System for Opioid Overdose Surveillance, or SOS. Um, so this system um, collects data from medical examiners, um, both suspected overdoses, 
um, and uh, confirmed opioid-related deaths are included in SOS. Um, we have partnered with an electronic uh, death database, MDI log, as well as individual medical examiners to uh, collect this data in real time. We are working with Myhin um, to receive clinical opioid overdose uh, ADT messages in emergency departments. And then lastly, we uh, receive uh, statewide naloxone administration data um, from the database MyEmphasis. So all of this data, um, so both non-fatal and fatal, um, is collected and integrated into the system for opioid overdose surveillance. Um, data will be linked um, in order to increase quality and ensure we're not over or under counting um, cases. So for example, if one individual um, is transported um, by an EMS agency, ends up in the emergency department, and then subsequently um, and that same one opioid overdose ends up at the medical examiner's table, um, in order to not count that as three cases, we'll be probabilistically matching um, these three data sources. Um, and then the um, ultimate goal in what we're doing is then providing these um, reports uh, to community partners. Um, so community coalitions, public health, public safety, in order for them to implement um, interventions in areas and uh, allocate resources. Um, so we will have a web-based um, dashboard by the fall of this year where uh, stakeholders can log in and, and, and view um, their area. Um, right now, um, we have sort of a preliminary, somewhat technical interface um, where our team is able to log into this local, local host um, and um, uh, click on a county. As you can see here, we clicked on um, Wayne Medical Examiner. Um, so then this um, initial screen pops up. The original dates of interest are just the uh, last two weeks. Um, so when I was putting together this uh, presentation, that was um, end of April to mid-May. And then we can really easily um, change the dates in the web browser to uh, change the dates to whatever uh, we are interested in. And we uh, change these dates based on stakeholder needs and, and what the community uh, would like to see. Um, and then here is just an example of the current um, PDF report that we are able to um, uh, disseminate to stakeholders in the community. So getting a little bit more into the actual data, um, so here's an example of the Wayne County year-to-date um, as of mid-May suspected fatal overdoses. Um, there were 208 total um, in Wayne County. Uh, so the lighter dots are closer to January, and then the darker uh, dots are ones uh, closer to mid-May. And then here's a temporal view of the year-to-date. Um, so as you can see, uh, the frequency um, changes. So some days there are two, some days there are um, as many as six or seven. Um, so something we're uh, integrating into the system um, are certain spike alerts. So we're working with stakeholders to determine when they would like to be notified um, the next day. So if, for example, uh, one community coalition wants to know every time there are more than four suspected fatal overdoses, that was something we would be able to let them know in real time. Um, and again, here's just an example of a, a, the pre previous two weeks. Um, so there were 30 suspected overdoses, and this was actually a 30% decrease um, relative to the two-week period prior to this one. Um, and then again, here is the temporal um, view that, that stakeholders are able to see. And here is our, um, another example of naloxone administration. So in total, um, in the two weeks of uh, April to mid-April, 173 naloxone administrations, which was a 14% uh, decrease from the two weeks prior. And then again, here's the uh, temporal frequencies. So we have uh, 14s um, on that first date, and then it uh, increases up higher than 20 on another. Um, 
So um, with all that in mind, these were our initial um, SOS reports. Uh, we are working with uh, two different areas, the Washtenaw County Health Department and the Detroit Health Department to really do a uh, deep qualitative dive. Um, so we've uh, created focus groups uh, and stakeholder groups where we're showing these reports, um, asking for feedback. Um, and then changing the reports based on feedback we receive. Um, so we certainly, um, a, a major goal is to make sure we're creating the system in a way that is usable and helpful to stakeholders. Um, so that, that's the initial um, approach that we're taking for the, these two pilot projects. Um, so we'll really be evaluating the community needs and then creating toolkits on um, opioid overdose response strategies in these two areas. Um, so we started SOS back in 2016. Um, we uh, first um, were in Washtenaw County. We have since then expanded, um, and by June 2020, we anticipate having uh, full state coverage. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'll hand it over to Matt. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Matthew Buck. I am the State Assistant Administrator at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services in the Bureau of Epi Epidemiology and Population Health. Uh, so it's a, a bit of a mouthful. Um, I wanted to start off today by thanking my hand first and foremost for uh, putting this conference on and bringing us together so that we can discuss this, but also for their support uh, in the project that I'm about to tell you about. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Simmer and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan uh, none of what we're trying to build through our ADT surveillance system would be possible without the vision uh, and leadership that they have provided. So thank you to, to all of you. Um, thank you to uh, Jared and Amanda as well for leading us off. I think this is a good primer for what I'm about to discuss. Um, I, I want to talk about a, a little bit of background on the problem that we have from a surveillance perspective at MDHHS. Um, and I should be very careful to note that there are many parts of the department that are, are involved in the response to the opioid overdose epidemic. Uh, we have the Bureau of Health and Wellness doing prevention activities, the Office of Recovery-Oriented Systems of Care doing uh, treatment and, and response. Uh, we have the Bureau of Emergency Trauma and Preparedness who's heavily involved in EMS uh, particularly around myemsis, like, like Amanda noted. Um, and then, of course, we have my team as well in the Bureau of Epidemiology and Population Health doing surveillance. Um, one of the things, um, sort of give the basis of where we are, we received our first funding under a cooperative agreement from the CDC back in 2017. It was the Enhanced State Opioid uh, Overdose Surveillance Cooperative Agreement, so ESOS. Um, that was focused on, within a two-year period, we had to take our existing infrastructure and our existing resources and try to figure out how could we leverage those for opioid overdose response uh, and surveillance. We said there are two things that we're doing primarily right now. We're abstracting death records out of ME systems, and we're doing syndromic surveillance as well, which kind of goes back to bioterrorism. Uh, post-2001, and it was a system that we've, we've had in place for, for quite some time. So we adapted both these models, and we tried to make them fit uh, to the opioid overdose epidemic to see what kind of information that could provide from a surveillance perspective. Um, the, the, one of the first things that we noticed, which persists to this day, is that there is lack of access to timely, complete, person-identifiable, line-level, non-fatal overdose data. Uh, so Jared was talking about the, sort of the five key indicators that the department's looking at, and you might notice that one of the things that's noticeably absent is non-fatal overdoses, and it's because we don't have good data around that quite yet. Um, so while ME data is very, very complete, um, it can be difficult to get a hold of. Um, it is certainly not timely. It takes the National Center for Healthcare st or Health Statistics uh, upwards of a year to codify that under the ICD-10 mortality edition. Um, and it doesn't, of course, inform us on non-fatal overdoses either. Syndromic surveillance is very, very quick. It is rapid, it is dirty, it is on the ground as much as it can possibly get, uh, but it requires a particular level of expertise in understanding how to work with those data. Um, it, it is uh, highly sensitive um, and not at all specific. So from an EPI perspective, um, you really have to know what you're doing to make good sense of those data. 
So we decided that we needed to sort of uh, bridge that gap uh, and, and meet this need uh, in sort of elucidating an understanding of uh, who is experiencing non-fatal overdoses. Because we know that uh, in terms of those who are at risk of dying for, from an opioid overdose death, the greatest, the, the best indicator is those who have experienced an overdose in the past. So we need insight into this problem. Uh, we have a very good, close working relationship with MyHen. We called them up, and they came to the table uh, ready. Um, they're sort of our partner in this, and we need to let we want to leverage our HIE, you know, network of network infrastructure, in taking advantage of the ADT messages that are mature. Uh, this is an existing system. Um, I have to say, I'd, I'm thinking back to some of the, the presentations yesterday. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg and Dr. Gettinger, um, in sort of their, their amicable sort of debate back and forth, I found myself agreeing with both of them all the time. Uh, so I feel a little bit like Schrodinger's presenter right now. Um, they were engaged in this sort of this nice debate, and it was heated, and it was great, it was amicable. Um, but the one thing that Dr. Rosenberg said that I think really stuck out for me and sort of uh, gelled where we are from population health and, and understanding where we fit within the landscape um, is that we're not the only ones uh, who are sort of trying to figure out how to use ADTs. It's great that we have telemedicine, it's great that we have fire, that, you know, these boundaries that are being pushed, that needs to continue to move forward. But we also do need to make sure that we're doing a better job of leveraging the existing resources that we have at our disposal. And I think Dr. Dr. Rosenberg was absolutely correct and he hit the nail on the head when he said that, and that's what we're trying to do here as well. Uh, so we want to take advantage of this, this mature ADT infrastructure and figure out how that can inform us on non-fatal um, non overdoses. Um, ADT messages represent probably the best available balance across the attributes that we look for in data for public health surveillance. There's a variety of them, as we know. And, you know, the moment you start trying to improve one, there's an offset and sort of you lessen the availability of the other. So this is the best balance between something that's most timely and complete. And of course, it's person identifiable as well. Um, paired with this, we are implementing a set of administrative rules at the department that will make opioid overdoses and other drug poisonings reportable at our request. So this is mimicking, mimicking sort of what we've done with communicable disease reporting, um, chemical poisonings, and um, occupational injury, for example. So when these rules are in place, the emergency rules are in place currently. The final administrative rule set will be in place, hopefully, in the very near future. Um, that will give us the authority to request from healthcare providers that you report to the department uh, when somebody presents at your facility with a suspected drug overdose or opioid overdose in this case. Um, this will hopefully, our, the structure of the solution that we're trying to implement will hopefully minimize impact on reporters. Um, through meaningful use in the past several years, uh, we have a lot of experience in onboarding healthcare facilities for electronic lab rep uh, reporting, for example. So that ORU message profile in the, in the HL7 message um, has proven very, very beneficial for communicable disease surveillance, but we started that activity in 2010, and we are still onboarding providers today. Unique onboarding of individual submitters is, t is not timely, it is cumbersome, it requires a lot of resources, both from a state perspective and from a healthcare community perspective. And we want to mitigate that as much as possible. We don't have the time to spend nine years onboarding providers for opioid overdose surveillance. We need to be able to flip on a light switch and see, see what we can get as quickly as possible. So ADTs provide that, uh, that solution. And because the healthcare community is already exchanging those ADT messages, we're hoping this is going to minimize the impact uh, on your facilities. This uh, system that we're building will serve as the central repository for the drug uh, overdose reports that are sent to us. So once the administrative rules are implemented, um, reporting into the system by ADT will meet the compliance necessary for the administrative rule set. MyHen will be establishing a listener, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it's essentially coupled to the side of the existing feeds of, of ADT messages. Uh, we have developed a value set predicated on ICD-10 uh, CM uh, that will look for, I think we have 2,111 codes across a variety of different uh, drug poisonings, about 185 of which are related to opioid overdose in particular. Uh, once that listener identifies that there is a corresponding ICD-10 code, it'll route a copy of that ADT message to us. We will parse that into our system where we'll build out patient profiles and event profiles by patient over time. Um, 
We are well aware that not every provider, not every hospital facility in the state of Michigan participates in the pay for performance incentives, which have uh, really led to this ADT maturity. Uh, so we are well aware that we also need to have a manual case entry portal into this system so that we can capture um, all reports throughout the state, even for those who aren't participating in ADT. Um, and this is being built within the Michigan Disease Surveillance System, which is our communicable disease um, surveillance uh, module, uh, because we can leverage existing infrastructure there as well, patient deduplication, how we merge events in, uh, over time, um, some basic uh, you know, behind-the-scenes functionality. And thankfully, our, our, our friends at Altarum, who are the developers of MDSS, um, have been extremely helpful in, in moving this forward as well. Uh, there are benefits and limitations to everything, right? So one of the benefits, like I mentioned, is that this limits the impact on upstream submitters of ADT data. Why would we reinvent the wheel when such rich information already exists? Uh, the caveat to this, of course, is that it's entirely reliant on use of ICD-10 codes. Uh, we did a very quick, um, I would say, cursory review of some syndromic data about three or four weeks ago. And one of our EPIs noticed that in 2018, a full 13% of all the syndromic reports that we received into our system didn't include any kind of diagnostic information that would have indicated that opioids were involved. Yet we got that as an opioid referral because of the case definition behind the, or the case, the syndromic definition, I should say, that supported the, re the referral coming to us. So they captured some other narrative or some other word within, the, within that message that routed it to us in the syndromic model. So 13% were flagged as a chief complaint coming in the door at an emergency department that did not, did not have a corresponding ICD-10 code that represented uh, opioid overdose on the back end. We would see things like acidosis, which perfectly makes sense, right? Somebody could have acidosis as a result of an opioid overdose, but we need to see opioid overdose coded. So if I were to give one piece of advice to the healthcare community, if you're trying to minimize the impact of uh, reporting opi opioid overdoses to the state of Michigan, make sure your facilities are using ICD-10 codes that represent uh, opioid overdoses. It's the single best thing you can do to help, help move this forward. Our timeline for this, uh, the emergency administrative rules are already in place. However, we are not leveraging them quite yet. We have made the promise from the Bureau of Epi that we will not ask you, the healthcare community, to send routine ongoing reports of opioid overdoses until we're equipped to receive those in an automated fashion to minimize the burden on you and to make sure that we're getting as complete referrals as possible. Uh, the final administrative rule sets are forthcoming. We just wrapped up the administrative rule package, I want to say last week, and got that up uh, to head out to the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. Uh, they have a certain amount of time to review that, at which point it, it will come, given that they don't have any feedback for us, it will take full effect and it will replace the emergency rules. Version one of this system will go and go live into production around Labor Day. Um, the caveat to that is that the manual functionality will not be included in version one. So again, when version one rolls out, we will not be making a request to the healthcare community to send these referrals. We might ask for voluntary submissions. We might do some uh, parallel pre-production uh, testing. Um, but because that manual functionality won't exist at that time, we don't feel comfortable making a request uh, for ongoing referrals. Version 2 uh, should be in production by the end of this year. At that point, the manual um, reporting functionality will exist, and at that point, most likely, uh, we will probably be making a formal request for referrals of opioid overdose or other drug poisonings as well. So what does this mean for the future? Um, well, we know that... Um, you know, thanks to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, that there is high saturation of ADTs throughout the state of Michigan. We heard yesterday several times that we are sort of well prepared as a state, probably better than many other states, if not most other states, to, to leverage this data source and other data sources like it because of that infrastructure that we've invested in. Um, and you know, ADTs are timely. I think one of the one of the challenges that I think we're going to have to figure out how to adapt to from a departmental perspective um, is that in ELR. You know, we onboard each unique submitter, and that gives us time to do validation and onboarding activities to help refine the value and sort of the, the quality of that message. We won't have that opportunity here because those messages already exist, but through working with our partners at Blue Cross Blue Shield and MyHen, we can start identifying where there are weaknesses in conformance and help write better implementation guides or provide feedback uh, that help incentivize better use of, uh, of that ADT by the healthcare community over time. 
Uh, other similar existing data feeds uh, also uh, we can also leverage them. I think we really want to prove this use case through ADT first. Then we'll start taking advantage of things like CCDs. We're doing something like this already with electronic case reporting and communicable disease surveillance that should hopefully within the next couple months go live. But we'd like to leverage that here as well. Um, and ELR feeds for toxicological findings. Uh, you think about an ME uh, examiner doing a report. They do a series of toxicological screenings and tests. Uh, those reports come back. We need a way to feed those in the system. Between ADTs, ELR, and CCDs, we should be able to merge relatively complete patient profiles over time. Uh, and of course, this could be expanded not just uh, vertically within uh, the opioid overdose uh, arena, but also horizontally into other parts of population health surveillance as well. Stroke is the, the first one that comes to mind. Uh, I was talking with uh, Cynthia this morning, um, and I've had um, some discussion with some people at, at the department as well, uh, where I think this is probably the most likely second use case that we'll see uh, moving towards ADT. Uh, there's my contact information. If you have any questions, please, please, please reach out. I'll be more than happy to continue discussion. Um, if you've got questions about the emergency, or the, the administrative rules, or, or how this is all going to be implemented, uh, I'd, I'd love to sit down and, and talk with you. There are some resources as well. Um, our, our partners at the Michigan Health and Hospital Association were kind enough to post a, an FAQ around the uh, emergency administrative rule set. This was back in December or January that they posted this. Um, if you go to Google and you Google MHA Opioid Emergency Michigan, this is one of the first results that pops up. So um, if you've got questions about the administrative rule set, take a look here. This FAQ is specific to the emergency rules. It's going to be virtually exactly the same for the final rule set with some nominal changes. But um, other than that, I think we can get to the Q&A. So thank you all. I th before we go to Q&A, I wanted to do a little bit of challenging uh, the audience because what we've just heard is phenomenal work in helping us come to grips with an extraordinarily important problem. I think the, the numbers that shocked me that, that were displayed was number one in 2017 in the state of Michigan, 2,686 deaths. Think of the number of people in this room. Think of empty seats that exceed several rooms like this because of deaths due to this problem. This is of such an urgent, critical nature. Everybody is affected by it. We need to really act on this information. So I, I would like to, oh, incidentally, the other thing was that, that shocked me was 932 needle, neonatal abstinence syndrome cases. Literally 1,000 cases of people starting off life with that type of an issue. And, um, and so there's many dimensions to this, and I don't think we can even talk specifically about what we're going to do about that component, but it's just staggering the magnitude of this problem. So we saw that, um, that the way we want to look at this is prevention, um, early intervention, and treatment. And so I'd like to take that model and just make sure that everyone in the room feels a sense of ownership of pulling forward this information into something that's useful. We heard that from a standpoint of prevention that oftentimes the initial exposure of the person to opioids is through a, an event, a sprained ankle, a tonsillectomy, it's, uh, a wisdom tooth extraction, where plenty of opioids were prescribed, it generated a sensation that there was a craving to repeat, and you see this type of problem. We have Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan data across 12 procedures. Patients who had not filled a prescription in the prior six months, they, they have a procedure that is not associated with prolonged pain. 6% of all opioid-naive patients going to surgery, receiving opioids, continue to fill them after 90 days. So obviously, in prevention, we want to curtail the number of people getting their wisdom teeth out who end up with a, a major problem, or getting their tonsils out, or getting, getting their, their procedures. 
So that is a place where we've actually enjoyed a certain amount of success, but we have a long, long way to go. The data connecting that early experience with the people who die of opioid overdose is not really strong. That was really from surveys of people in an urban setting roughly 20 years ago that we got that information. A lot of the sort of focus on medical prescribing is also a consequence of the fact that medical examiners in the past did not have the information they needed and really couldn't um, tag the event as being due to illicit drugs because the tools that they had did not give them enough information to know. And there was a systematic over-reporting of the deaths being related to prescription drugs. So this evolving nature of exposure being through prescriptions versus street drugs is an unknown, and we need more information to clarify that. In terms of early intervention, um, we have a, a, a real need to examine the processes that are in place to help people with substance use disorder. And you have a situation where our delivery model is extraordinarily fragmented. You have an inpatient detox experience, you have an, an overdose situation that didn't result in death, and the emergency department wanting to refer to a, a program that can be evidence-based and successful. Well, the one that's most evidence-based right now is medication-assisted therapy. Medication-assisted therapy is generally unavailable. For persons working in the EDs and discharging patients from the hospitals, they recognize that often there is no, even if they wanted to coordinate care, there's no handshake. So uh, Dr. Amy McKenzie, could you stand? Um, doc Dr. Amy McKenzie is a family physician who's the leader of um, all collaborative clinical programs with, that Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan has um, with the provider community, both through collaborative quality initiatives as well as through the Physician Group Incentive Plan, or PGIP. And she and her team are going to be working with you to make sure that the state of Michigan has medication-assisted therapy available throughout the state, and that therapy is able to connect with emergency departments and hospitals because they need connection so that the patient receives evaluation intervention the next day. It is, it is not easy, partly because of a training that's required, which forces Fortunately, the University of Michigan has been standing up a training unit to be able to be leveraged for any providers who are interested in learning how to do this. But this is not for the faint-hearted. The uh, uh, APRIS data in Michigan shows that roughly 10% of patients who get medication-assisted therapy die of overdose. This is really heavy responsibility to, for people to take. It requires a team in order to do this. You need to have masters of social workers and other types of, of people, whether it's peer support or, or, and so on, and therefore this whole concept of team-based care needs to be supported, and we need to understand how to pay for that to make sure that it happens. We can't strand these poor people who are attempting to deliver medication-assisted therapy with all the burdens that's entailed in terms of responsiveness and uh, seriousness of the condition that, that is being treated. So this type of um, early intervention and treatment is a major challenge throughout our state, and I hope all of you will, will take it seriously in, in terms of making sure that our state has that type of uh, team-based care available when it's needed throughout the state. Uh, getting to the sort of questions and answers now, I, I wanted to start with an initial question, then that will be pleased to um, welcome questions from, from the audience. Uh, we did have an earlier presentation that suggested that naloxone treatment um, should be uh, over-the-counter. That was a suggestion, and we heard 
that from Jared that we have a program um, that makes standing order for naloxone a possibility. And I was wondering, Jared, if you could comment on what's the difference between a standing order and being over the counter? How does that work? And um, do you perceive that we need to go further than where we are? Or is the standing order approach, do you think, the uh, sort of destination of where we want to be? physician approval for the medication. Uh, so what you uh, have with a standing order is the, your, the physician that is uh, prescribing the medication is uh, the state's chief medical executive, which is now Dr. Joné Caldoun, is who signs off on the naloxone standing order. It's still for patients. They can go to the pharmacy. They doesn't need to do, have to do an office visit to a provider or and doesn't need to identify a particular patient. Um, but as far as having naloxone as over-the-counter versus the way it is now, certainly we, we promote the access to naloxone as much as possible, and anything that will increase access to naloxone is something we're really uh, consider supportive, being supportive of. So if I'm going to my usual Saturday night party, and I know that there may be people at that party who um, are endangering themselves by using and we did learn from an earlier presentation that over 50% of overdose events are witnessed. Um, would that mean that I would be able to go to a pharmacy under the authority of this authorization from the state and ask for naloxone for me to bring with me just in case I find myself in the presence of others who are, um, who are perhaps in need of, of naloxone right away? Yep, that's exactly. What, what it means. And it's oftentimes we see it is friends and family that are uh, taking, uh, that are taking advantage of having the naloxone standing order and the increased availability, so. Very interesting. I hadn't really understood that uh, completely. Um, okay, why don't we open it up to questions from the, the audience. Yes, we have a question here. We'll just unite the questioner with the microphone. Thank you for the great information shared this morning. My question is for Matt Buck. Um, you share of all of the efforts that you're doing in collecting this information, and I wanted to hear what are your plans once you have all of this data, how you plan to share it with the community. Also, I wanted to encourage, I guess, if you could leverage the POs, you know, the physician organizations that are working directly with the providers that most likely these patients that had an overdose belong to one of these providers or are attributed to them, and the POs have the relationship with the providers, how can we help? How can we bring the community together? Most of the time we have access to the um, uh, community resources or the hospitals, emergency department, physicians. So how can we all just bring it all together and be part of this information so we're not conflicting, you know, so the providers are not receiving conflicting information on how they could act and in, in, in making any improvements? So I, I think I'll start. Can you hear me? I don't know. If, yeah, it's okay. Um, I'll start by answering your second point first. Um, in terms of what we can do to connect with POs, um, if you've got my contact information, uh, reach out to me. That'd be fantastic. Uh, I'm, like I said, I'm always willing to sit down and have some discussion with anybody uh, who wants to come to the table. Um, I don't know exactly how that would work, but we could figure that out, right? Um, how we get a relationship in place where we can leverage your network and, and help disseminate that information downstream is absolutely critical. Uh, I think our initial target right now, there's some low-hanging fruit that we, we know we can get at, and then there's some more difficult challenges that we need to address in, in terms of making this information useful. The first one, of course, is sort of gets to the point that Amanda was talking about as well, is that it's hotspot identification. Um, we don't really have a sense at this point how dynamic those hotspots are. Do they change in size? Do they change in geography and location? Um, do they stay in the same place all the time? It's, it's hard to answer those questions at this point in time. Uh, we need to leverage across different data sources to make that um, more understandable. 
there are things that we can do in interactions uh, with physicians. If we're, we identify key geographic hotspot areas, uh, we need physicians, as Dr. Simmer was pointing out, who are data wavered uh, to be able to do MAT uh, w with their patients um, in-house or referring to the appropriate level of care. But then also understanding, um, I was thinking about this specific question this morning, uh, what if there's a physician who's already data wavered and we're seeing a hotspot uh, in their area and we're identifying that through this ADT system? Maybe that's an indication, as Dr. Rosimmer was saying, that there's not enough support behind that physician to help them do their job more effectively, right? It's not just about providing the level of education and then moving on. There's, there's a whole wraparound that has to occur there, both with the patient and with the physician. Um, so I th I'm hopeful that these ADT data will provide insight to that for us. Um, the most immediate thing, though, is hotspot identification. That is sort of the, um, what we've been when saying since we started development on this work. I'd like to just add a, a comment there that's really emphasizing a point that Matt's made. Matt has been an absolutely outstanding partner to my hand uh, related to this and many other information sharing um, programs with the state. For all of this information to lead to better understanding and actionable events, we need it to be good data, as, as Matt mentioned. That means we really need to pay attention to those acres files and, and dedupe them. You, everybody has cards on their tables saying, we need good information so that we, we can rely on that to say this patient and this doctor have a relationship that we can leverage. The common key, it doesn't do any good if the, the perfect information that's really clean and wonderful never makes it to its destination because there's ne a lack of match between the two individuals due to lack of uh, the, the just plain hard work of getting the common key uh, implementation uh, completed. You already heard the need to uh, document and um, insert in the um, information in the ADT all of the proper essentially billing codes that would allow us to listen to the message in, in, a, in the first generation approach. And then you heard that the CCDs will be the next generation. Well, that means we really have to work through the um, wonderful program that Myhin and the Michigan State Medical Society are working on for the, um, the use of ambulatory CCDs to be exported from the EMRs so that we can populate a lot of information that goes beyond the ICD-10. So that work is something we all can do, and all of these great efforts really do depend on that infrastructure being leveraged, as, as Matt pointed out. If we have a great system to leverage, a lot of these, these programs will find that they're much more successful than they would have been um, without those efforts by the physician organizations. Uh, more questions from the audience, please. Um, good morning. Thank you very much for the panel. It was so well prepared and fabulous. Um, I'm, I'm Mary Mitch. I'm from University of Detroit Mercy. And I'm very interested in some of your, um, I'm a nurse anthropologist, so I was very interested in some of your gender demographics. It looks like um, some of your, um, the majority of your deaths were white males. And um, it's, it runs so parallel to also the shootings we've had in our culture. Some of them are, you know, they're white young adults. And I'm wondering, you said you were doing a qualitative deep dive. How, what are you doing with that data? Is it being analyzed and how are you gonna publish that? And, and what are you finding? I, I was very, very interested in that from the social construction viewpoint. Yes, certainly. Um, so in the uh, Detroit uh, qualitative work we're working on right now, um, that project is actually uh, just getting ramped up. Um, we've uh, created the stakeholder group um, and are actually having our kickoff uh, focus group um, mid-June. Um, so I can't really speak to what we've um, found uh, quite yet. Um, in the fall, though, we will have a sort of toolkit on um, 
community responses uh, to the epidemic in Detroit. Um, so I'm happy to touch base with you in a few months um, to kind of share more of those results. I have two questions. One, um, are you anticipating or do you have training for the patients and caregivers to administer the naloxone? And then the second question is on your future roadmap, are EMS included in there for data gathering? Um, they are also one that um, may administer naloxone and never transport the patient to the ED. So there's another group of patients that can, uh, that need care and can be identified. Do you want to take the first part? I'll take the first one. Yeah. Yeah, so we do fund uh, through, the, our, through our 10 PIHPs to uh, train in the uh, use and the administration of naloxone. Um, so that is something that we are funding. Um, as, far, as far as EMS, I'll turn that yeah. over to Matt. Um, so for EMS, yes, we are absolutely interested in that, as you can tell in, in Amanda's discussion. Um, connecting those data is critical, and, and, and we have uh, been tried to be very supportive of U of M's efforts because we see a lot of value in what they're doing. Um, there's also, I mean, there's EMS data that they're going to be using through the SOS project, but then there's sort of S, or you know, EMS data writ large, right? So what does that mean? Well, in through the Bureau of, Epide of um, EMS Trauma and Preparedness, uh, there is a system called MyEMSYS. It's the Michigan Emergency Medical Services Information System uh, that feeds into the national NEMSYS system. Uh, through a current cooperative agreement under CDC, we're in the process of trying to implement some more up-to-date software <laughs> that will allow us to leverage those data better than we currently can. Um, that data mart is currently in the process of being sort of purchased and implemented uh, right now. So it's hard, I can't give you sort of any concrete timelines or what the output is gonna look like, but we do know that that matching across data sets, across time to present that continuum of care, even with just an emergent framework, um, is absolutely critical. So yes, um, that is something we're actively trying to do. We have another question in the back. It's coming <laughs> from all directions. Hi, um, Allison Johnson from the Michigan Public Health Institute. Um, I just have a quick question. You guys have been talking a lot about having accurate data and uh, the medical examiner system came up several times in the discussion. And uh, just from some previous work that we've done, um, to my knowledge, Michigan doesn't have a standardized uh, medical examiner system and there are some inconsistencies with um, resources and um, how each uh, region kind of um, operates and I know that there are systems in place for when um, certain deaths occur you can um, transport them to other areas to get those um, opinions uh, from other medical examiners. But I guess my question is, is there any concern with how the data is being collected um, and whether there are inconsistencies, especially, um, I know you guys had mentioned that in Wayne County you have um, data there with high target areas. But um, I also know that Wayne has a pretty um, extensive medical examiner system there. And so I'm wondering if uh, you have any concerns how that is operating in other areas of the state, um, so specifically in some of the more rural areas. Do you mind if I start? Yeah. I can, okay. So I, I'm, I'm absolutely interested to hear from Amanda um, in terms of those ver that variability uh, across the data because I think your, your point is well taken and it's something we've absolutely seen um, at the state as well. Um, you are correct that there is no central ME model in the state of Michigan. We, we have a decentralized federated medical examiner community. Um, there is cost and benefit and you know to whatever model you would take. Um, I can tell you there's an, 
again, another project we're also working on uh, with funding uh, from the National Center for Health Statistics. We have a task order to uh, streamline and improve how death reporting from ME offices occurs within the state. So we'll be uh, establishing some web services and open API frameworks between MDI log, which uh, has about 50% of it, it, MDI log is an ME case management system um, by produced by occupational uh, ORAs. There, I can't remember their full name. I apologize. Um, they have about 50% saturation of the market in, in Michigan, um, so they are our test bed. Uh, we are hoping to write a set of standards where this could be transferable to other ME case management systems as well. Um, we don't yet have a full understanding of how transferable that will be, but we hope to build something that's generalizable enough that other case management systems can adopt that infrastructure as well. That'll streamline the routing of de death data. We can, we're also streamlining the communications between us and NCHS to get better, uh, more timely coded data that doesn't take a year, but rather takes minutes. Um, and then passing that to downstream systems like the opioid uh, surveillance system as well. So standardizing that practice within a technological framework is sort of our target, understanding that there is huge vari variability across how MEs actually implement that down at the local level. And I think that's going to take the ME community to really drive that. Uh, Dr. Schmidt out of uh, Wayne County, who you mentioned, and Dr. Joyce DeYoung out of the west side of Michigan have been very vocal supporters. Uh, they've been fantastic to work with, and they have been the biggest advocates, I would say, about the standardization of practice. And we're sort of kind of relying on them to help move that forward. Thank you, Matt. Um, just to kind of piggyback off that, uh, we, uh, our uh, SOS's mentality is uh, at this point, we'll take what we can get data-wise. Um, so for example, Wayne County, we go through uh, the reports by hand and uh, look at toxicology and autopsy. Um, similar to Matt, we work really closely with the medical examiner community um, and really advocate for you know standardized toxicology across counties, um, MDI log, who um, uh, contributes data to SOS. Uh, the owner, Stephen Clark, really advocates with the medical examiners to, um, you know, increase toxicology reporting. Um, but to date, yes, that's, it's certainly a, a large challenge. Well, I'd like to conclude by saying, first of all, that that process of the medical examiners has gotten so much better in the last year due to the efforts of our panelists here and Mayhin that it's almost completely um, changed from pessimism to optimism in terms of the support that medical examiners um, now have. It is true that it's a decentralized system, but um, everyone should take encouragement from the fact that, that so much progress has been made. It's, it's almost amazing. Um, as we, we did hear from Dr. DeYoung um, in her presentation um, yesterday. I want to thank everyone. We have gone a minute over time, but um, if you can please join me in, in thanking Amanda, Matthew, and Jared um, for the great work that they've done and the very informative presentations that they gave.